Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Today kicks off our first of our series of nine um, Critical Access Hospital CEO and CFO webinars, um, January through August of this year. And so today we're joined um, by Jonathan and Greg, and I believe Greg is going to kick us off. We do have a smaller group today. We are recording this. We will get this posted on our YouTube channel. If anyone has a question, since we are a smaller group, feel free to unmute yourselves, put something in the chat. Um, if you're watching this recording, please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions at all. With that said, I will turn it over to Greg. Thanks, Laura. This is Greg Wolf from Wintergreen. I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Jonathan Pattenberg. Um, the webinar today is part of a series of webinars supported through uh, the Office of Rural Health, which is uh, housed at Oklahoma State University there in Oklahoma. And uh, Laura Brooks is your Flex Grant coordinator, and we really appreciate uh, a chance to spend some time with you today, and we um, really appreciate uh, our opportunity to work directly with Laura. Oklahoma has a great critical access hospital program, and it's, it's a privilege to be part of that. Um, I wanted to say a couple of, uh, just to share with you a couple of, of thoughts. I know in the past that um, through Oklahoma's FLEX program, there have been all kinds of financial and operational activities, uh, some of which I've worked on uh, along with Jonathan um, as part of our former firm. Many of you may be familiar with uh, Stroudwater Associates, which is headquartered up here in Portland, Maine. Um, Jonathan and I um, left Stroudwater last uh, summer, and we formed a new company called uh, Wintergreen. And um, it's great that we have a chance to keep working with um, the uh, critical access hospitals in uh, in Oklahoma, and we look forward to uh, to the uh, opportunity to do some webinars between now and the end of August, which is the close of the cycle. And uh, the topics are predicated on your input on the priorities that you've identified, and we're looking forward to it. So much appreciated, and thank you, Laura, and thank you to the Oklahoma. Critical Access Hospital community. Jonathan? Thanks, Greg. <clears throat> so as Greg had mentioned, what we really want to do as a part of the webinar series is pull together specific topics based on where we are sitting as critical access hospitals, both within the state of Oklahoma and things that we're experiencing across the country. Now, the document that we're going to put up on today, the, the presentation, has a number of best practices and opportunities that we can look at as an organization operating within that environment. Now, as we talk through today, I'm going to highlight certain key points. There, in addition to that, there's several other best practices that are in this document that are really as a leave behind that you can then take that information and leverage that at a future date. Now, I've said this countless times over the past couple of years, but we're really in an environment where we are in an environment of increasing cost in either stagnant or declining reimbursements. And what it's doing is it's putting an additional burden on us as organizations to really ensure that we can continue to provide those vital services going forward. I'm sure many of you have had staffing shortages or had to pay exorbitant rates around traveler nurses or different people over the past couple of years. And as we start to come out of the COVID pandemic, and for many of us, it's over and we've started to move forward from that, we're left with an environment that is drastically different than what we were experiencing before the pandemic ever started. Many of us have seen an outward migration of services or a reconsolidation of services in urbanized areas. Many of us have seen volumes disappear, staff disappear. All of those different things have changed the environment and how we can ultimately continue to deliver care going forward. So what we have to do as organizations is position ourselves to be effective, not only in the current environment, but also continue to be effective going forward based on the changes of those reimbursement methodologies and staffing designs and, and delivery of care and all of those different factors. Now, when we talk about the change in the landscape, it doesn't matter if we operate rural health clinics, provider-based clinics, if we're just doing inpatient services and emergency services and those poor critical access hospital services, we really have to position ourselves going forward to be able to meet the demands of our patient population. 
Now, there's been some drastic changes over the past couple of years for us operating as rural hospitals. Um, one of the major ones was the change in the federal, uh, based on the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021, that changed the RHC reimbursement methodology going forward for all rural health clinics. Gone are the days of where we used to be able to get uncapped cost-based reimbursement for our rural health clinics. Going forward, us operating as critical access hospitals that may operate those rural health clinics, we're now subject to an upper payment limit going forward. Um, some of you may recall the presentation I've done over the past couple months around the rural emergency hospital. That's a new designation that has come out that is really gaining some traction in certain parts of the country around how we can start to offer a different level of services by getting out of those inpatient services within those communities. Now, again, is a designation like that a solver? Is it an end all for many organizations? No, it is not. We all have to start to evaluate these things and take into account the changing landscape and continue to position ourselves to be effective going forward. Now, today's presentation fits under the overall framework of really a performance improvement model or a performance model. And what we really have to start to do is figure out our value to the community. Now, prior to the pandemic, many organizations often had a kind of like a field of dreams type approach. And if you build it, they will come approach relative to the delivery of care. I can't tell you how many times Greg and I were in a presentation or visiting a hospital where a CEO or somebody would come up and say, listen, we have the ability to add on an orthopedic surgeon. And, and just because this provider wants to come to our community, we want to bring in this provider. And oftentimes those organizations had not done the financial analysis to really vet out whether or not the community could support those services or whether or not there was actually truly a need within the community. This is one of the major areas that we have to look at going forward from a best practice approaches is starting to ensure the services that we're providing are truly needed within the community and that they can be sustained going forward. Now, again, I'm not saying to get rid of services that you can't sustain or different things to that degree, but at the very minimum from a financial and clinical approach, we have to ensure that we understand the financial ramifications of the programs that we're providing on the general financial solvency of the organization. In addition to that, we have to evaluate the services we're providing to ensure that those providers have the clinical competencies to provide those services going forward. Now, when we talk about an overall performance model, everything rolls up to really the value to the community. We have to evaluate the cost, the clinical delivery of care, the quality outcomes, patient satisfaction, all of those different things ultimately roll up into the value of the community. Now, when we think about the organization, it's really segmented into two major areas. We have our strategy side and we have our operations side. Now, oftentimes what ends up happening is, is when we establish strategy as an organization, we tend to think very much at that macro level. And oftentimes we're not getting down into the weeds enough to really evaluate what is the strategy going to do to either the day-to-day -day operations, the con continued delivery of care, the impact on staffing and so forth. So what we really have to start to do is start to consider the strategy and the overall ramifications on operations. Now, what we've seen often is this becomes difficult in many instances because a lot of times strategy is driven at the top executive level and also done in conjunction with the board. And oftentimes there's the disconnect between how those different things can ultimately impact operations going forward. Now, by no means am I saying that we want to get our boards involved in day-to-day -day operations, but we have to understand that as we're starting to drive some of those strategies going forward, that we have to take into account the operational impact of those strategy decisions to ensure that we continue to operate effectively going forward. For instance, you know, we have, may have as a part of our strategy to expand into a new service line without doing the financial modeling or the feasibility assessment or even determining whether or not we could get in clinical staff to provide that service. We have to make sure that we start doing all of the different steps so that we can make well-informed decisions relative to the future position of the direction of the hospital. Now on the other side is really looking at operations. Now when we look at operations, this has one of the most segmented areas probably of any industry out there. And it really comes down to finance slash quality slash clinical. 
And oftentimes what ends up happening is finance is doing finance things and clinical slash quality is doing the quality components and clinical delivery of care. We have to start to break down those silos and start to get a merging, realizing that finance has a direct impact on quality and quality and clinical outcomes has a direct impact on financial performance. Now, as we continue to operate as an organization, we have revenues, we have expense structures, we have all of those different factors that play into and drive the overall ability to focus on patient care and achieving our overall strategy. Now, as a critical access hospital, one thing I wanna to emphasize too is when we're looking at our organization, because we receive cost-based reimbursement from Medicare and in many states, Medicaid, we oftentimes cannot cut our way to success. Now, this is not to say that we can't operate efficiently and effectively, but we have minimum staffing standards. We have certain requirements that we have to meet. And if we wanna continue operating as a critical access hospital, we have to ensure that we continue to provide those key services going forward. For instance, as a critical access hospital, we can't just shut down our emergency room. We still have to operate an emergency room as a critical access hospital. Inpatient care, we still have to offer those core services to be able to meet the CAW conditions of participation. So oftentimes what ends up happening with a critical access hospital is many people will try to cut their way to success for that organization. They think that if you pull out enough expense or if you start to look at it to that degree that ultimately you will be able to get to a profitable position. Now to think of it to that degree, if we are 50% cost-based as an organization, meaning that 50% of our revenue is attributed to Medicare and Medicaid if it's cost-based, if we pull out $100,000 in expense, we're gonna pull out that 50% in reimbursements coming on the other side. Because again, the cost structure directly drives the revenue side. Now on the inverse of that also, when we look at critical access hospitals, one of the things I would say that we need to start focusing on more than the expense side is how we can start to grow revenue and how we can start to increase volume within our hospital. Oftentimes, most CFOs, most individuals, most departments, it's a lot easier to focus on the expense side because that is something that we can directly relate to. We see the cost associated with staffing. We see the cost for supplies. We see the cost for electricity. All of those things are a lot easier to evaluate because there is that direct expense going forward. It is a lot harder to increase revenue for an organization because that is something we have to take a proactive approach and really work at going forward. Now, I've always said critical access hospitals have the ability to be the cheapest provider of care. They can also be the most expensive provider of care. Now, on the expensive side, a perfect example of this is our swing bed program. Many of you have probably heard concerns over the recent years about the cost of care in a swing bed program. And oftentimes what ends up happening, particularly those that are involved in a system relationship and an ACO model or some type of population health type initiative is your organization will look at the cost of care and say, your routine rate is $2,000 in a swing bed program. When we could put it in a nursing home, it's only $450 we're gonna start directing patient care to that nursing home instead of keeping it at that swing bed program. Now, because of the direct ramifications on the cost report, by diluting down the cost or the visits, generally the cost structure the same, all you're gonna do is continue to increase the cost per unit of service for each one of those patient days that remains at that facility. So what we really have to do is start to educate our system partners and start to educate other entities that we work with to say, if we can start to increase reliance and increase utilization of our facility, because variable cost is much less than the total fixed cost that we have, we will be able to start to dilute down the cost of care going forward and make ourselves much more cost efficient or cost effective in that environment. So again, the solver for critical access hospitals, I know Greg has presented on this around rural health clinics and it's very much the same. The solver for critical access hospitals is most times the ability to increase volume relative to the expense structure. I know many of you are probably saying, well, gee, it's easy just to increase volume and to talk about it to that degree. 
where we have to start focusing as organizations is how we can improve efficiencies, how we can improve overall performance within our organization to really start to drive that position going forward. Now, oftentimes operating in rural communities, you know, I can remember my days as a CFO, you know, on Monday, you're a CFO, on Tuesday, you're the CIO, on Wednesday, you're pulling cabling for the facility. We wear so many different hats in the rural market that it's oftentimes difficult to focus on truly those performance improvement initiatives. But oftentimes those inefficiencies are what are preventing us from achieving many of our goals. Um, Greg and I were just at a clinic a couple months ago and we ended up talking to the providers and we talked to the staff and we realized that they had set a standard appointment time for many of their clinics at 30 minutes and 60 minutes instead of a standard either 20, 40 or 15, 30, depending upon the, the conditions of your patients. But what we realized is that there were barriers in place as to why they couldn't get to a lower patient time for each one of those visits and each one of those providers. There was technological or limitations. They didn't all have access to computers. They had shared workstations. They have a lot of things that were preventing them. Same thing, they were sharing multiple exam rooms among various different providers. So again, there were a lot of different things that were preventing them from achieving those different results. We really have to start to look at each one of those different opportunities to say, how can we start to improve performance and how can we look at it in those factors? Now, a few moments ago, I was talking about the siloing of clinical and finance. And if we go all the way back to the early 80s, we really had three main segments. We had quality, revenue cycle, and finance. And that was really the starting point of where each one of those was viewed independently and there really wasn't much continuity or cross-pollination across each of those different areas. In the 90s, not much changed. We changed quality assurance to quality improvement, but again, very much still a siloing of those different areas. It wasn't until we got to 2000 that we really started to see across the broader industry, a merging of finance and revenue cycle realizing that the financial performance of the organization oftentimes was driven much by the revenue cycle functions, whether it was claims adjudication, whether it was point of service collections, whether it was contract negotiations, that full revenue cycle spectrum really drove the overall financial performance. And they started to merge those two groups together to really start to focus on a finance slash revenue cycle committee. But nonetheless, quality was still very much on its side. It wasn't until today's times, and this has really been something that I've been discussing over the past year, is those organizations that have really looked at how we can break down the siloing of quality slash clinical and finance and really come together in truly a strategy-focused performance improvement group, we will continue to see many of those inefficiencies across organizations. And I'll give you an example. Um, we were doing a site visit at a hospital, and we ended up having a conversation with the clinical side and the financial side. So we talked to their clinical, their you know, the quality committee, and we also talked to the revenue cycle committee. They actually had conflicting metrics in each one of those committees, where if finance was to achieve their performance improvement metric, the clinical side would not have been able to achieve theirs. And on the inverse, if the clinical side had been able to achieve theirs, it would have negatively impacted the finance side and actually not allowed them to achieve their financial metric. So again, start to break down that siloing. And if you could take anything away from this presentation today, it would really be that. Break down the siloing between clinical and finance, come together as a true collective of a group and start to drive performance improvement initiatives, realizing that our providers, our clinical staff have a direct impact on the claims process, the documentation, all of those different factors. And on the finance side, the financial sustainability of our organization has a direct impact on how many staff we can hire, what we can reinvest in, all of those additional services that we can provide. We have to break down that siloing and start to come together as a collective unit. Now, before I get into more of the best practices, I wanted to spend a couple seconds talking about the distribution between variable cost and fixed cost. 
Now, we as critical access hospitals have a significant amount of money set aside on the expense side on truly the fixed cost side. Now, when we think fixed cost, that's our core unit staffing, medical direction, providers, medical equipment, the facility cost, all of those different things. All of that cost, even if we're to cut volumes, that fixed cost is going to remain there. There's no way that we can get rid of that fixed cost. The variable cost is really the certain minor cost that we can impact going forward. And that's really driven by each of the different services that we're providing on a day-to-day -day basis. Again, it's the incremental medical supplies, pharmaceutical, food costs. Um, if we end up going above what our core staffing can provide on the inpatient unit, it may increase the staffing to that degree. We may hire, you know, buy more solvents and stuff or reagents for lab equipment. So again, all of that stuff is our variable cost. Now, when we look at an organization as a critical access hospital, the distribution between fixed cost and variable cost is usually between 80 to 90% fixed and only 10 to 20% variable. So when we start looking at that cost structure, it's changing the dynamic away from, again, those expense conversations and starting to look at those volume conversations and realizing that as we increase our units of service, it starts to dilute down that fixed cost among a greater level of services. So again, if our total fixed cost is a million dollars and we have a thousand visits, then our cost is going to be that million divided by a thousand. If we're able to increase our volume to 2000 and our, vo our fixed cost is still that million and we have a minor variable cost increase, then again, dividing that million dollars by 2000 visits lowers that cost per unit of service pretty significantly as we look at those areas. Now, one of the areas that we've seen this impacted the most is really in our swing bed program. Again, as our swing bed volume goes down, many of us have seen that routine rate go up pretty considerably. As we can start to increase our average daily census and our reliance on the program, the routine rate can drop pretty drastically. And we've seen them down as low as eight, $900 at some top performing critical access hospitals compared to what I would say is the average routine rate of between $1,500 and $2,000 for many of our critical access hospitals across the country. Now, one of the things that is good to focus on as we start to look forward as a critical access hospital is really start to define our scope of practice or care. And this should really be done in every major department. It should be done in our emergency room, our acute care services, our swing bed services, physical therapy. What our scope of practice is looking at is it's an evaluation of all of the different services that could be provided at a hospital, say for acute care services or swing bed services. Then what it's doing is it's going through and evaluating the ability of our staff, the medical equipment, our providers, the facility itself, all of those different factors. It's evaluating whether or not we have the competencies, the capability, the equipment, and so forth to provide those services. And what it really is, is it's a delineation of the different services that can be provided and the evaluation from a approach to really define the gaps that are preventing us from providing those different services going forward. Now, we've gone into many organizations before where maybe we have up here on wound care. Now, maybe we have the staff capabilities to provide wound care. We can get the referrals. We have the equipment. We have all of those different things, except the only piece of equipment we don't have is a wound bag. Now, when we look at it to that degree, if the only piece of equipment that is preventing us from taking wound care patients is a wound vac, then that's the identification of a barrier that we can look to resolve going forward to say, do we want to acquire a wound vac? Do we want to create a relationship that if we end up taking in those patients, we can rent a wound vac? Again, look at all of those different factors. Oftentimes, organizations, what we've realized, have searched for different ways to say no, why we can't take a patient as opposed to looking at different ways as to how we can take those patients. The organizations that evaluate and really look at those gaps and those barriers that are preventing them from taking patients have seen year over year increases in their volumes, increases in their quality, increases in their patient outcomes because they're looking at those different ways as to how they can increase competencies, 
and really look at increasing the service reliance on your facility as a whole. Now, I'll give you a perfect example. I was at a facility one time and they had, I think about six or seven IV pumps at the facility. And they wanted to look at expanding into doing long-term IV antibiotics for the swing bed program. Now, this is one where the CNO at that facility said, listen, we can get up to about 14, 15 patients in our swing bed program if we could start to look at increasing the number of IV pumps. So the CFO and the CNO actually worked together to come up with a pro forma, evaluating the cost of purchasing more of those IV pumps, and then realizing what that would have led to in an increase in volume for the facility. This is a perfect example of where the clinical and finance were working together to ultimately achieve a better outcome for the facility. Again, on the clinical side, they had more access to equipment. They had the ability to care for more patients, on the finance side, they knew that they had the financial resources and the volumes to be able to reimburse them for the equipment that they were going to purchase. So again, start to look at different ways that you can break this down. Now, one also way that is great when we look at that to that degree is by starting to look at those different services, you can also start to identify educational opportunities for how you can start to work with your staff. Again, if we find out that we have certain gaps or barriers in providing different services, we can start to establish those educational programs to work on the clinical competencies for our staff. Also, what it can allow us to do is to more easily determine from an efficiency approach the types of patients we should and should not be providing at our facility. For example, if a patient presents to the emergency room with a head trauma, and we've gone through this process and determined that we're not equipped, nor do we have the staff or the equipment or the facilities to provide neuro type services, then this is a patient that we should be quickly transferring to another facility because we've already evaluated that and established our scope of practice based on all of those different factors. So again, it can help quicken the process and start to determine what patients should be transferred and what patients should remain at your facility for those services. Now we're gonna jump into some more of the best practices around facilities, whether it be provider, revenue cycle, cost reporting, and so forth. Now, when we talk about provider complement, what I would say is one of the biggest opportunities with our provider complement, particularly in today's environment, is really starting to catalog all of the providers that can offer services within your service area. Oftentimes when we go into facilities, they will create a catalog only of the providers that are either directly employed by them or directly contracted by them to provide services affiliated with their facility. Now, as we look at the service need within our communities, we have to expand those catalogs to start to include any providers that provide care within your community. Now, this is especially important as we start to look at what type of services we wanna add going forward. And the reason for that is because when we're evaluating what services we need to add, we need to evaluate from the perspective of what is the need within the community? Is there a number of providers that can provide those services now? And if we increase the service within our community, is it something we can sustain going forward? We were once at a facility that was looking to add OB services. And there was already another hospital within their primary service area that had a full developed OB program. And when they looked at the patient population, again, this was another example where they wanted to add a provider because they had somebody that wanted to come to their community. There was not enough of a service area to support that full OB program at that other facility, plus also support the OB provider that wanted to come to this facility. Now, again, it's not to say don't bring in those providers. You may establish a specific strategy and a marketing approach as to how you're going to capture other business, but you have to do that on the preliminary before you decide to bring in one of those providers going forward. Again, take those proactive approaches to ensure that it's a well-crafted, thought-out strategy. As many of us have also seen, we've started to see a transition more towards population-based outcomes, whether we're doing chronic care management, transitional care management, whether we're doing patient-centered medical home, all of those different things are different things that we want to start to incorporate in our facilities. Now, I'm not saying that we want to go out and get PCMH certified. I'm not going out to say that we want to do other type of risk-based contracts or different things to that degree, but we need to start to position ourselves effectively in the industry 
so that we're not blindsided as the industry starts to move in that direction. Again, we can start to negotiate PM, PM type contracts with commercial payers, even if we're operating a rural health clinic or even if we're operating a provider-based clinic. We can do chronic care management. We can do certain types of population-based initiatives that start to allow us to move in that direction while we're still in that fee-for-service environment to start to position ourselves effectively as we go forward. We also want to start to look at different services that we're providing going forward relative to our acute case, patient care. Again, oftentimes we will go into a facility and they're not leveraging an interqual or MCG, the minimum care guidelines to really determine what type of patients should be receiving services within their facility. We have to start to look at those, particularly because many of the commercial payers and Medicare Advantage plans are starting to push back on the acute care admissions and trying to push as many of those patients into an observation status. So again, we really have to start to work at how we can start to position ourselves to ensure that those patients meet medical necessity and they are placed in the appropriate level of care. Another opportunity that I would really say is a best practice is start to ensure that our coders are engaging regularly with our providers. Again, as there's changes in coding requirements, as there's changes in terminology or different terminology that is used to substantiate claims, it's important to have our coders continue to engage the providers to ensure that they know how the CPT codes are changing relative to the delivery of care. Again, there's also different terms that we can't put in a medical record that if we ever get audited could be a flag from an insurance company. And I'll give you an example. There was once a patient that was admitted to an acute care, and this patient met every single requirement relative to that acute patient admission. Unfortunately, that provider had written in the medical record that they needed to go back and observe that patient within the next 24 hours to follow up on a specific condition. Once the insurance company got a hold of the medical record, the fact that they saw the word observe in that medical record they denied that claim and said it should have been an observation status, not an acute care admission because of the use of a term. Now, to me, that seems kind of ridiculous, um, but nonetheless, we have to start to sharpen how we're looking at these different things going forward. Another thing we can do also, particularly those that are operating in rural communities or that are farther away from um, specialty providers, we have to start looking at integrating or leveraging telehealth as a means to expand access within our communities. A perfect example, you know, recently the rural health clinic program, it changed where now we can start to offer distance site behavioral health services in a rural health clinic. This is something that we can leverage because many of our communities have a shortage of behavioral health services in addition to the primary care services. We can also look at starting to expand teleservices around hospital services or specialty services. Start to reach out and leverage technology as a means to increase access to care in those rural communities so that we can continue to push forward. Again, it puts us in the position where our patients are not having to drive to urban areas and also ensures that they can keep those services within those local communities. We also wanna ensure that we establish really that scope of care within that inpatient unit. Another opportunity that I would say particularly goes well as we look at our rural communities, especially in today's environment, is really start to establish effective nurse to patient ratios. Now, oftentimes as we see patient volume start to drop, staff will get more acclimated to working at lower nurse to patient ratios. If you go into an acute care facility, oftentimes it's a six to one ratio, ICU is a three to one, swing bed is an eight to one. As we start to see those declines, we start to see nurses and staff get more acclimated to those lower volumes. We have to ensure that we put those processes in place and really establish a staffing plan that starts to look at flexing staffing based on the volumes within our facilities. Now, again, if our average daily census is only a four, it's not like we can only have a part-time nurse there. We still have to have that 24-7 coverage on the med surge floor. But as we start to get into those upper volumes, if we get to a six to one and we're able to establish that within the competencies of our staff and our providers feel confident and comfortable, we don't have to increase another nurse 
because we've been operating at a four to one because of the COVID pandemic or the environment we were in. So again, start to establish those nurse to patient ratios against those industry standards, and then start to work at training staff to get up to those standards going forward. This will help us as we start to look at growing volumes going forward and putting ourselves in a better position. It'll be extremely difficult for you as an organization to operate and maintain financial solvency if you operate a med surge floor on a four to one ratio or a five to one ratio that is more consistent with an ICU than is more consistent with an acute slash swing bed setting. So again, look at all those different factors. What we also wanna look at is how we can get everybody to operate at the top of their license. Um, oftentimes more organizations will try to bring in another RN or an LPN or somebody to that degree to provide certain services. When we're looking at that staffing complement, we wanna look at leveraging all of the appropriate staff. If something can be done by a CNA and that you don't need an RN to do it, we should be looking at supplementing our RNs with CNAs or LPNs. Again, if something doesn't need to be done by an LPN and it can be done by a CNA or something doesn't need to be done by a physician can be done by an RN, we want to try to get the lowest costing individual that is within their license to provide that service to provide those services going forward. Oftentimes, when we end up operating within rural communities, we tend to build out a large complement of RNs that are doing many things that is much more costly that could be done by a CNA or done by an LPN or somebody else. So again, look at all of those factors. The same thing on the clinic side also. You know, have we had a certain number of MAs that are assigned to each of our physicians? Or do we have RNs and physicians and providers doing most of the services within those clinics? We've been to many clinics before where we've seen RNs and physicians actually rooming their own patients because they did not want to spend the additional money on hiring an MA to actually supplement that provider. Now, if we can get an MA to supplement those providers, those providers will now free up their time where they can actually see more patients. So again, look at all of those different factors and increase reliance on those lower costing individuals so that those higher costing individuals can spend more time on doing the services that are really required for their license. Now, about swing bed services, one of the things that I would like to say relative to the swing bed services is we really have to start to look at how we can differentiate ourselves from other providers and other facilities. Oftentimes, swing bed programs will only look at long-term IV antibiotics or long-term rehab type services for their swing bed services. If we have staff that can do wound care, if we can specialize in trachs, again, we have to meet those core swing bed requirements, but because rural communities oftentimes get staff that have expertise in certain areas, we can leverage that expertise as a way to expand services that other facilities often cannot provide. So again, create that niche market and then use that as a leverage point for where you can start to reach out to other facilities to increase reliance on your facility. The next area is really around taking a proactive approach towards the pursuit of patients. And I would say that this is probably the biggest opportunity relative to swing bed growth going forward. Oftentimes organizations will assign swing bed growth to an individual that has 20 other responsibilities. And generally, those individuals are waiting for referrals to be sent to their facility. Now, swing bed services is a very competitive offering where you have SNFs that are providing it, you got your swing beds, you have rehab facilities. The patient that is looking for swing beds facility services is already in an acute care setting. This patient is generally being referred to you by a larger hospital or they've come by the way of your own hospital. Organizations that take a proactive approach and are actively reaching out to larger facilities on a day-to-day -day basis have a much higher success rate in maintaining the occupancy level that they're pursuing than those organizations that are waiting for the referrals to come to them. In addition to you're actively reaching out to larger facilities, you can target patients that fit well within that spectrum of services that you're providing yourself, that scope of practice. So again, take that proactive role and start to go after patients instead of waiting for patients to be referred to you.
The next area is really around the admissions process. Now, when we look at swing bed programs, I've always liked to say a good guide or target is to look at four swing bed patients per 10,000 people in the primary service area. So if you have 10,000 people, you should be able to achieve four. If you have 20,000 people, you should be at eight. Now use this as a guide for targeting a specific patient population. It's by no means the end all be all of what your population and what your swing bed average daily census should be. The hospital I was last at, we had an average daily census of about 14 in a primary service area of about 16 to 18,000 people. So again, we well exceeded that threshold because we took a very proactive approach and we established ourselves as a center of excellence relative to wound care and long-term IV antibiotics. Now, when we talk about the swing bed admissions themselves, when we're comparing ourselves to other facilities, most other SNFs or nursing homes or rehab facilities can make a yes or no decision within two hours to three hours to say yes or no whether or not they could accept that patient. Critical access hospitals on average are anywhere from four hours well in excess of a day. So if we wanna be competitive with those other facilities, we really need to streamline the process and start to engage those facilities and our internal staff to get our yes or no decision within a couple hours as to whether or not we can accept that patient. Again, if it takes us two days to make a decision, most other facilities are gonna take those easy to care for patients. They're not gonna wait for your facility to accept that patient. The next biggest opportunity is really around leveraging what is called our swing bed NF rate. Now, oftentimes when we talk to organizations, they feel that they need to get your daily routine rate for commercial and non-Medicare business within that swing bed program. And if your daily routine rate is $1,000 and a commercial payer is going to pay you $500, oftentimes we'll have conversations where they feel that they're going to lose money because that cost-based rate is $1,000 and they're only getting $500. That's not the way it works on the cost report. And once we know our swing bed NF rate, we can use that as a negotiation factor when we're reaching out to commercial payers or larger facilities around getting patients into our facility. Now, generally the way it works as a critical access hospital is Medicare will subtract the total number of non-Medicare days times that Medicaid NF carve out rate to determine how much cost they are going to pull off your cost report before determining that daily routine rate. So what this means is that if we're able to negotiate a $500 daily rate with a commercial payer and our Medicaid NF carve out rate is $250, we're gonna make $250 profit relative to the cost report impact that determines that daily routine rate. So again, we wanna look at this number and we wanna use it as a leverage point. And I'll give you an example. There was a hospital in New York that was doing drug detox type services or rehab services. Now, this organization was able to negotiate a $1,000 daily rate um, for those patients. Their cost report carve out was about $230. They were making over $700 profit relative to the cost report impact by accepting and negotiating with those providers. So again, look at this as an opportunity <clears throat> to how you can pursue things going forward. We've also had hospitals leverage this and actually contract directly with larger facilities. If you know of a facility is diverting because their beds are full, maybe they're willing to pay you a $100 daily rate so that they can free up a bed and take another 15, $20,000 DRG patient. So again, leverage this realizing that it doesn't directly hurt you on the cost report going forward. The next area is really around emergency services. Now, when we talk about emergency services, I would say that the most important thing in rural communities and really the best practice is to evaluate the services that are being provided in our emergency room to ensure that our emergency room is not being used as either an urgent care center or what has been coined in the industry as kind of a Band-Aid station. And the way that we can evaluate this is we really wanna look at the distribution of services. Are we doing more 99281s, 2s, and 3s? Are we doing more 4s and 5s? Again, we want to evaluate that bell curve. And if we're doing a lot of low number services, 
we may want to evaluate urgent care in our community or extended hours at one of our clinics or even an ED redirect program. Again, look at all of those different factors. The emergency room is one of the most costly departments that we can provide as a critical access hospital. And the over-reliance on our emergency room for non-emergent services will have a direct negative impact on the financial performance of our organization. Even at a minimum, if we're able to reduce down the number of patients that are utilizing the emergency room and getting placed in an urgent care or primary care practice, that will even flow through in the degree of the amount of time for our providers that goes into the cost report as standby time as opposed to being carved out of your cost report as professional time. We also want to evaluate all of the patients that are coming into our emergency room for appropriateness and transfers. Again, oftentimes, if we haven't defined our scope of practice, we may be transferring patients to other facilities that could have received inpatient care at our facility. So again, look at all of those different factors on the back end so that you can evaluate, are there ways to expand your competencies? Are there ways to increase the services provided at your facility? Now, probably the most focused on area or the most important area in recent times is really around revenue cycle. And this really flows into the finance side. Now, when I say the most important side, what I really mean is important to getting reimbursed for the services that you're providing. Now, oftentimes, many of us have seen an increase in the number of denials, an increase in the number of prior authorizations required. But what many organizations are doing is they're not focusing enough on the front end processes, which is drastically increasing the work on the back end. Now, what I mean by front end processes, it's doing all of the contract negotiations, getting payers credentialed, collecting insurance cards when patients prevent or present at the actual service, collecting co-pays, updating information. All of that stuff is front end processes that will drastically reduce the amount of time on the back end. If we don't collect an insurance card from our patient or that insurance card is expired, that makes it much more difficult to collect from that patient after the fact if we don't have that information updated. Again, if we're not getting prior authorizations for swing bed services or surgical services, it's a lot more difficult to get reimbursed for those services or it comes with a lot greater risk for the organization if we're not doing those processes up front and we're trying to accomplish them after the fact. Another opportunity is really starting to look at our, our charge description master. What I would say is we want to regularly and periodically look at our CDM to evaluate the prices that we're charging to assure that we're priced effectively, not only for the services that we provide, but also within the community that we're offering those services. Now, for our Medicare patient population, because on the outpatient services, their coinsurance is 20% of charge, we have to take that into account when we're pricing our different services. What can happen is, is that if we start to price ourselves relative to urban areas, we can end up charging our patients hundreds and hundreds of dollars for services that would be a $20, $30, $40 copay if they were getting that at a non-critical access hospital. So again, take our pricing methodology into account and look at all of those different factors. On the cost report, we really want to start to evaluate our cost report for opportunities to improve reimbursement through the accuracy of our cost report. I cannot tell you how many cost reports we've reviewed where organizations have left money on the table because they have not effectively placed information based on how they operate as a facility. I'll give you a perfect example, looking at our, our emergency room standby time. You know, are we doing the effective time studies to ensure that we're charging correctly and that we're appropriating the cost between the provider and the standby time for professional purposes? We've been into clinics or emergency rooms before where the average time and the way they were doing time studies was when the provider actually presented to the emergency room and when that patient left, was the ultimate time that they were using to calculate the standby time and the professional time. And we've had some hospitals that have reported upwards of 90 to 100 minutes of professional time per patient visit. Now, 
I haven't been to an emergency room in recent years, but I can tell you I'm not familiar with many emergency rooms where a provider is spending an hour and a half directly on delivering patient care. Now, because as critical access hospitals, we get reimbursed through the cost report for standby time for those emergency room providers. This is an example where it's extremely important to ensure that we're doing those time studies and that we're accurately tracking the reporting of expense and not overstating the, the, the time that those providers are working with patients. Now, I've always kind of referred to it as the three Ds. It's documenting, discussing, and delivering care. When the provider is doing one of those three things, that counts as professional time. Even if the doctor is waiting in the emergency room for results to come back, or they're just waiting in the emergency room because a patient has just left, and they're waiting for the workup of another patient before they get started, that is all standby time. Again, it's only the time that they're documenting, discussing, and delivering care. So this is an area that we as organizations can really start to sharpen our pencil that will have a direct impact on the reimbursements that we will receive. Another area that we wanna look at that ties back to the cost report and also to revenue cycle is monitoring our ratio of cost to charges. A great worksheet to look at is the worksheet C because this breaks down the ratio of cost to charges between each of the different departments, those cost centers. Now, when we look at our RCCs, if the number is greater than one, that means that we do not have enough charges relative to our cost to actually support those services. And that means that for every dollar that we're charging, say our RCC is a 1.5, for every dollar that we charge, we're getting a dollar 50 back from Medicare. Now, anything that is less than one means that our charges for that department are higher than the total cost. So this is a good way to look at relative to our pricing and our pricing methodology. If you're looking at your RCCs and you have an RCC for a department that's like a 0 0.02, that means your charges are astronomically higher than what your total cost is for that department. On the inverse of that, if it's significantly higher than one, that means that your cost is significantly higher than your charges. I'll give you an example. I was looking at a cost report yesterday where one of the RCCs for one of their departments was a six. So that means that their cost was actually six times higher than all of the charges for that department. So again, take these things into account when we're pricing things. The last slide before, uh, the last point I wanted to emphasize before I open it up to any questions is, again, we really have to start to look at different opportunities as to how we can increase our financial position without really increasing a significant amount of cost for our facility. There are several ways that we can improve performance and there are several ways that we can improve um, volumes at our facility by starting to focus on performance improvement initiatives. Again, every opportunity that we can increase volume at our facility is only going to benefit us in the long-term for our facility. I'm gonna pause now. I know I went through a lot of different information and we have about six minutes left. So I'm gonna to pause to see if there's any questions that I can answer. So not seeing any questions come in, um, I'm going to turn it back to Laura. Again, if you do have questions, my contact information is also included in the slide deck, um, which I know Laura will share and it is recorded and will also be shared. If you have any questions that pop up later, please do not hesitate to reach out. Um, as Greg and Laura had mentioned, we have a long-term relationship in Oklahoma, and we really want to be able to answer any questions that you have. And if we can't, we can at least point you in the right direction to get those answers. Uh, so with that, I will turn it back over to Laura. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jonathan. I did want to remind everyone our next scheduled webinar is February 16th at noon. We'll be going over um, using your Medicare cost reports to reveal opportunities. So with that said, if you run into any questions between now and then, please let us know. Thank you, Lori, for the great comment.
And um, thank you, Jonathan and Greg. Y'all have a great rest of your day. Thank you.